we've got the uh, pleasure of hosting Dr. Alan Williams, who's a uh, wealth of knowledge concerning animal agriculture, particularly regenerative animal agriculture. So it should be a great discussion today. If you guys want to check this out in its entirety, come on over to Meet Our Ex, join up for free, jump on the meeting. All right. Gotcha. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Alan. I know I've interviewed you before on a different podcast. For, if you don't know, this is a this is a, the Meet Our Ex podcast. We have a community of dedicated carnivorous people here that are big fans of meat, and we're also big supporters of, of what people like you do, ranchers in general, and then certainly those folks that are making a big difference in the regenerative world. Um, Alan, for those that don't know you, would you mind just giving us a little quick background to tell, them what, tell us what your background's in, your education's in, if, if that's okay? Sure, I'd be happy to. So uh, just very quickly, grew up on my family's farm in South Carolina. They've been there since 1840, so I represent the sixth generation uh, out of that lineage there. But uh, went to school at uh, Clemson University and, and uh, Louisiana State University, so I call myself a double tiger. Uh, and we, uh, I majored in animal science, uh, got a PhD in genetics and, uh, reproductive physiology and ended up 15 years in academia, teaching, doing research in, in various phases academia as a full tenure professor after 15 years. That was in the year 2000, went back into private business full time. So we farm and ranch. Uh, we also have a consulting company called uh, Understanding Ag, and we have a nonprofit called the Soil Health Academy. Uh, and uh, I'm integrally involved in our uh, uh, meat company called Joyce Farms and uh, at our farm here in Alabama called uh, BDA, short for Boyce D'Arc Farms uh, down here in Alabama. And uh, we're heavily focused on regenerative agriculture and good food. So that, that's what we're all about, and that's what we produce at our farms and what we market to consumers. Thanks for that, that background, uh, Alan. Um, let me just, just, just for those that aren't familiar with the term, how do you define regenerative agriculture? So it's a good question. Uh, the way I like to define it is that we're – basically farming and ranching in synchrony with nature. Uh, we're using the free things that nature has given us, sunlight, photosynthesis, water, minerals in the soil, and microbes to be able to capture their benefits on a 24-7, 20, 365 basis. Uh, we, we like to uh, conduct our farming and ranching practices in a way that is building, repairing, revitalizing, and restoring fully functioning ecosystems. That, that's really what we strive for. And, and we have key indicators that we look at in that regard to be able to tell us whether we're doing that or not. But, but bottom line is, is, is it's farming and ranching in synchrony with nature. All right, and you know, I just I just retweeted a, a thing that uh, I don't know if you, if you're familiar with Nicolette uh, Han Neiman uh, in California. Oh yes, yes. So she just she just posted something about a North Dakota rancher uh, notes a 400 percent stocking rate due to regenerative ag. Can you talk about the significance of what that means for people that don't understand that? Yeah, it what it means is that we can have far more productivity off of the same acres than we've been experiencing our conventional agriculture that, that has been very prevalent over the last hundred plus years has led us to become very commoditized, very specialized, and to focus on monocultures, whether it's a monoculture of a crop or a monoculture species of livestock, just a single species of livestock. And what we have found is that through regenerative agricultural practices, we can actually have many different uh, enterprises off of the same acre in any given year, meaning that we can produce not only multiple revenue streams in a given year, but we can also produce multiple types of food products off of the exact same acre. And those acres, because of that, are far, far more productive 
And so the exact same acre can now produce a lot more livestock, a lot more crops, a lot more food for consumers on an annual basis. And in today's world, that's critically important and, and it's something that we need to be striving to accomplish a lot more. Yeah, and that's something uh, you do that devoid of pesticides, herbicides, and some of the other things that are more associated with the industrial, you know, uh, sort of cow, calf, stocker, feedlot, uh, you know, monoculture uh, type of uh, system. Is that correct? That that's absolutely correct. Uh, you know what we find is that as we get further down the path of regenerative practices, that we can begin to eliminate, but first reduce use of practices where we're requiring synthetics, chemicals, tillage, those types of things, and then eradicate those. And, and you know, within Joyce Farms and BDA Farm, those are the things that we focus on very heavily is being able to reduce and then eradicate those harmful practices. And that's what we teach within the Soil Health Academy so that people can learn how to effectively and economically viably do that. The biggest barrier to most farmers in doing that, quite frankly, is their lack of knowledge. You can't implement what you do not know and, and they're scared initially. So they have to gain that education so that they can gain that confidence and then confidently apply these regenerative principles to their operations. What is, you know, let's talk a little bit about the soil health and what, what are the benefits to it? I know there's some projections that we're gonna eventually run out of soil, some say 60 years, some people say that's a made up number, don't know where it came from, but regardless, uh, soil health seems to be important. Why is it important? You know, let, let, you know I, I, we have much wildfires out here in uh, the western part of the U.S. where I'm at right now. And, and can we talk a little bit about how soil helps the environment in general, in general terms, what are all the benefits? Absolutely. First of all, soil is a foundation for everything. Just like the building that you're in right now. If, if the builders had not first established a solid foundation, I'd be seeing cracks in the walls behind you and things like that. Your building wouldn't last very long. It's the same way with our soils. Our soils are the foundation for the entire food web and thus all of life. And the life in that soil and beneath that soil is absolutely critical for us here. So, so what we're looking at is being able to repair and rebuild and restore the life underneath the soil surface. And that's predominantly microbes and microorganisms. Now, once we do that, then a whole host of very positive compounding cascading effects start to occur. And they start with water infiltration and water retention. That's, and, and that's one of the biggest factors you're facing right now on the West Coast with the wildfires and the extreme devastation of the wildfires. You had a lot of drought ahead of these wildfires. And, uh, and, and if you were able to retain more soil moisture, then that would greatly reduce drought impacts and it would actually attract more rainfall and more moisture. So we're able to significantly reduce erosion, harmful runoff, we're able to significantly mitigate the impacts of flooding and drought. So we have far less severe flooding and severe drought. We're still gonna have some of those events, but they become more manageable events rather than the severe catastrophic events that are occurring today. We have far, far better mineral cycling because we have a much stronger microbial population in the soil. So that mineral cycling means the plants that are growing in that soil have far greater mineral uptake and therefore far greater nutrient density. And then for the livestock that eat those plants or for the humans that eat those plants, they therefore are taking up far greater nutrient density as well. 
And that means in the proteins that we eat, in the meat that we eat, the eggs, whatever, you know, the milk, all of that, it's going to have greater nutrient density and we're all going to benefit. Uh, and, and it's very cyclical in nature. So as these animals that are foraging and grazing out there are taking in higher nutrient density forages in the manure and urine that they're leaving behind back onto that soil, they are dumping back out a lot more nutrients and remineralizing the top strata of soil that over the past 400 to 500 years in North America has been so heavily mined out. Uh, these grazing ruminants are actually doing a very valuable job in being able to remineralize that strata of soil and restore it to its original status. We, we also have positive impacts on our ecosystem as we develop greater nutrient cycling in the soil, we see more plant diversity responding. That attracts more beneficial insects, more pollinators, more bird species and more wildlife species. So we see beneficial insect and wildlife species populations exploding and becoming far healthier. Uh, we also see benefits in terms of climate benefits. So as we retain more soil moisture and we keep living plants in the ground more on a year-round basis, then that greatly buffers severe climate impacts. And so we see far less severe climate events and more routine events. So rainfalls, rather than being catastrophic events and causing a lot of flooding, rainfalls are more routine. We have more manageable rainfall events and they're spread more evenly throughout the year. And we're already seeing that in areas where we've ha we have enough farmers and ranchers to have landscape scale impact. We are seeing significant climate change on those landscapes, even in the desert. And we, we had a webinar earlier this week featuring Alejandro Carrillo from Chihuahua, Mexico, who is greening the desert using these regenerative practices. And we have the direct data over the last five years to show that he has significantly and very positively altered rainfall events on his ranch. And he is literally now getting more rainfall than his neighbors are because of his regenerative practices. That's, that's truly interesting. I, I visited a ranch not far from me, and it's out in the California kind of desert, desert area. You know, we're pretty dry out here in Southern California. Uh, a guy named uh, Frank Fitzpatrick, he's got something called the Five Bar Ranch. And, you know, he had a fire. Uh, he had a dump truck catch on fire, and it just had a limited burn and went out. You know, it just it didn't spread because of the soil health was better. Um, let me ask you, and I know you and I have discussed this before, and I think it's very interesting, scalability. Uh, you know, we see people like, you know, there's a study that Will Harris has placed out of White Oaks Pasture showing definite carbon sequestration, net negative carbon. You know, you're actually putting carbon in the ground more than you're emitting, including the methane and whatever else people want to use for carbon equivalents. You had mentioned, you know, if we scale it to a certain percentage in the U.S., and then, you know, we would mitigate pretty much almost all of our carbon emissions if we got enough cows on the, on the pasture. How, talk to me about the, 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 the amount that we would need to do and if it is feasible. Absolutely. So first of all, what I'll tell you is that in, on our own farms, uh, like, like my farm and then uh, several of my partner's farms, like Gabe Brown, Dave Brandt and others, and then many of our clients' farms, we have documented uh, – soil carbon sequestration rates anywhere from three tons per acre annually to over seven tons per acre annually. And the, the better job that we do with our adaptive grazing practices and our regenerative practices, the more we sequester. So when you think about that, and for instance, I live down here in the deep south, and we have a lot of pine forests, but these are monoculture pine forests. 
the average monoculture pine forest in, in the deep south USA sequesters only about 1 to 1.4 tons of carbon annually. But yet with our grazing and regenerative practices, we're sequestering anywhere from 3 to 7 tons per acre annually. That's, that's several magnitudes higher, obviously. Uh, now, when we take a look at the number of acres that are currently being utilized for agriculture in North America, both in crop production and in animal grazing, if we were to implement regenerative practices on just 50% of those row crop and grazing acres, we would be able to pretty much eradicate our climate issue, our greenhouse gas emissions issue here in North America with just 50% of the agricultural acres. Now, obviously, we want to convert all of the 100% of those acres, but if we can just get to 50%, we are now net neutral across the U.S. Yeah, and that's a the U.S. is the biggest producer of greenhouse gases in the world per capita. So, I mean, that's a pretty big mitigation, I'd say. And, you know, some people argue about different things about that. But, I mean, the, the, the information is, uh, the, the data is there. Now, some people, like, I see, I don't know if it's IPCC or others, groups have, have put out reports saying, well, grass-finished beef is not sustainable and there's not enough acreage and, you know, it's not going to have the mitigation effect you think it is. That's a different metric from what I understand. I mean, traditional grass-finished beef, I had a guy named Greg Judy on the other day, and he said that they call it the Columbus method. You know, you set the cows out in the pasture in, in March, and you come get them in October, and they just, you know, they just graze down everything. And so it's not what you're doing. It's, it's an apples to oranges comparison. Is that fair to say? That, that is absolutely correct. When you look at any of those studies that have been published, that are saying that this is not attainable and this is not feasible. When every one of those studies, first of all, use modeling in their studies. And every time you use modeling, you're taking numbers from prior studies and throwing those into a modeling equation. And, uh, and you have to make certain assumptions. And those assumptions are made by the prior literature review that, that those scientists utilized. Well, there's a big issue with that because in almost every one of those peer-reviewed articles that they drew their assumptions from, there are major, major issues and errors with how they calculated things. And, and most of it has to do with the fact that they were using very conventional production systems in their estimates. And that's not what we're using at all. And so what we now know, and I've run these numbers, uh, and, and I ran these with uh, Jim Garrish and a, n a number of other key people in this sector to validate and verify them. And what we know is that currently in the U.S., about 30 million head of fat cattle are harvested annually okay, for our beef production. We have enough acres in the U.S. right now that are being severely underutilized grassland acres that if we utilize those properly using regenerative practices and adaptive grazing that we can produce right now more than 50 million head of grass finished cattle annually. So we do not have an issue with not having enough acres and not being able to get this done to supply everybody's beef demand. Our issue is being able to educate and train enough producers so that they can manage those acres under regenerative management. Yeah, and that, that assumption that you made about that, that, that I assume doesn't even include the uh, multi-species grazing, which you could also further increase the yield. Is that correct? That, that is absolutely correct. Uh, on the same acres, we can run, I'll just give you a quick example, you know, and we've, and we do this quite a bit here at BDA Farm, but we can run on the exact same acre at the same time. We can have cattle, we can have sheep, we can have chickens, we can have goats, you know, those types of things all running on the same acre at the same time. And it's all about how 
we move them across that acre. It's about time, duration, observation, and moving them very rapidly forward. So it's actually pretty simple. There's nothing hard about this. We just move our livestock every day. They go to a fresh acre every single day. And that is really, if, if there's any quote magic to this, that's it. And, and what are we doing? Why does that work so well? It works so well because what we're doing is called biomimicry and ecomimicry. We are simulating what the wild ruminant herds used to do here in North America, the bison, the antelope, the elk, where they moved in very, very large herds, sometimes hundreds of thousands of animals per herd, you know, in mass, but they were constantly on the move, right? So they never overgrazed an area. They never, they never destroyed an area. That's, that's exactly what we're doing. We're utilizing our livestock, mimicking the way that wild ruminants were moved across the landscape to accomplish the same profoundly positive effect. And this is all done without really any fossil fuel inputs. Uh, talk to me a little bit about water requirements. We often see that, uh, you know, people that are trying to promote alternative proteins that uh, beef just use all this water. I mean, it takes a bath, it takes a, you know, a, a swimming pool size amount of water to pr produce a, a, a hamburger. I mean, something along some ridiculous number like that. What is a true metric on water and how do we, how do we sort of talk about that? Yeah, it, so again, those numbers are based off of what? They're based off of commodity beef production. And this is wholly and substantially different than that. Um, so what we find is that actually we are just like we're carbon positive with this production system, we are also water positive with this production system. And I, I'll explain that. But the first thing I want to say is, you know, I want to make people aware that in many other forms of agriculture, uh, it takes, co the, if we're farming anything conventionally, no matter what it is, even if it's a plant-based product, we are still requiring copious amounts of water. So for instance, in conventional almond production, it takes a gallon of water to produce an almond, a single almond. Now that's that that should never happen, right? So, um, but why are we water positive? Okay, we're water positive because of several factors. First of all, whenever we have significantly higher levels of carbon sequestration, carbon being stuck back into the soil, and we're we're facilitating and building what we call that liquid carbon pathway, the carbon fraction that microbes rely on to fuel themselves so they can do their job, then that means that we're building a significantly higher soil aggregate layer. That creates the pore spaces in the soil for soils to absorb rainfall or irrigation water and to be able to retain that water. When we do that, we are now recharging our aquifers. We are recharging our springs, our uh, uh, streams, all of those types of things. So what we have seen is we have seen restoration of levels in aquifers. We have seen restoration of springs, and in many cases, springs that haven't been running for 60, 70, or 80 or more years are now all of a sudden showing up again and, and, and flowing with water. We're seeing streams that had dried up and for half the year or more were non-flowing that now flow year round because we have a lot more water being produced from grazing animals this way. So they actually restore water cycling and, and water retention into the soil when we graze them this way. The other thing is that they actually acquire less water themselves. The, when we're moving them every day and they're grazing the top third of these plants rather than being forced to graze much closer to the soil surface, they actually are meeting a lot more of their water requirements through the plants themselves. 
And because we're leaving a lot more residue on the soil and we're protecting soil moisture and soil temperature, even when it gets hot, they require less water and less shade because they are in contact with that cool, moist soil. So it, it's like sort of having their own capillary cooling system, like a radiator cooling system for an engine. You know, this is what's happening in their bodies because we're preserving the moisture in, in the cool temperature of the soil. But, if, but in conventional grazing and conventional production, where they're either grazing down very short and the soil temperature heats way up, or they're in a feedlot where it's bare soil. And when the sun is beaming down on that, that soil temperature can be 140 degrees plus. Whereas if it's protected by residue, that soil temperature is going to be 70 and 80 degrees. Huge, huge difference. Huge difference in water evaporative potential and in water retention and restoration of the water cycle. Yeah, I think that's somebody's asking a question about why would there be more rainfall? And I assume it's microclimate. I guess if there's more water in the soil, more goes up in the air and it comes right back down. Is that is that essentially what's happening with that? Yeah, I uh, w one of my very good friends is uh, Dr. Doug Gillum. Doug is a, uh, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service and was a three-time North American forecasting champion. So Doug is very, very good at what he does as a meteorologist and uh, has taught at the universities and everything else. And one of the key things, Doug and I have talked about this a lot, and one of the key things that he has told me as an expert meteorologist is that he would tell me, Alan, moisture breeds moisture and drought breeds drought. So in other words, it's not that systems and clouds don't pass over deserts, they do. They do almost on a daily basis but they don't drop their water there. Why? Why does, it, why does it rain a lot less? Because moisture from above has to attract, or moisture from below in the soil has to attract moisture from above. And over the desert, those soils are very dry, very hot, so the moisture above in the clouds just passes right on over. It doesn't rain until that moisture hits either a river a lake or moist soil. So that's why we have our issues. And when we create more desertification through poor agricultural and grazing practices, then we create less rainfall and that continues to com compound itself. But when we create more moisture in the soil through good grazing, and regenerative practices, then we create more rainfall and more evenly spaced rainfall. And that is exactly what we're seeing. Um, we, I, you know, the other day I interviewed a couple uh, bison ranchers up in South Dakota and they're doing regenerative technique. And, you know, they, for these cold climates where there's a lot of snow, you know, it seems like the bison might be more amenable to that. You'd have to do less, less hay feeding, you know, in the wintertime perhaps. What, what about the different regions? You know, like if, if I look at Texas, you know, Texas is where the biggest herd, herd in the U.S. is. We have like 20-some million cattle in Texas of our 95 or whatever. So Texas, a lot of Texas, particularly southwest Texas, hot desert. Um, certain place in the U.S., great for cattle grazing. I mean, you've got prime grassland. That, you know, it's just easy. How do you deal with the hard places? Because there's going to be some ranchers listening to this and they're going to say, well, that's all nice and good, but I don't live in southern Missouri or Kentucky or wherever, wherever the grass grows. I got to deal with snow. I got to deal with desert scrub. How do you, do you is it a different t breed of cattle? How do you do, how do you tailor those different, different areas? Yeah. So very good question. And uh, so, yes, you want, first of all, you want cattle and other livestock that are very much adapted to your region of production. So if I'm in a hot, humid region, like I am, I want breeds of cattle and breeds of sheep and so forth that are much more readily adapted to my region, that, that are better attuned to that heat and humidity. Uh, if I'm in the desert, if I'm in, uh, you know, southwest Texas or New Mexico or down in the Chihuahuan Desert in Mexico, then I want cattle that are adapted to that region. And that's going to mean, that means I'm going to select breeds 
that are more adapted to that region. The same thing if I go up into the northern climb. So if I'm in North Dakota or Montana or uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, I want breeds of livestock that are adapted to that region. So yes, that plays a huge role. But beyond adaptability, it's the way that we manage. And we have found that we can take the exact same regenerative agricultural principles and adaptive grazing practices and apply them in any, anywhere in the world, any environment, whether it's a desert environment, it's a cold environment, it's a hot environment, or a wet environment. And we can make practices and principles work and work very well. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when Alejandro gave his webinar this past Tuesday night, and by the way, that's available. They can go to understandingag.com or soilhealthacademy.org and view that webinar. It's called Greening Desert. And in that very brittle environment where Alejandro gets less than eight inches of rain a year, and that eight inches comes in just three months out of the year, and he has nine to 10 months that are dry, uh, he has been able to completely alter that desert. It now, his ranch looks like an oasis when you compare it to neighboring ranches around him because of these regenerative practices. So again, they work everywhere. Your environment doesn't matter. We just match up our breed types so that they're adapted and we match up our management, specific management practices to that specific type of environment. What, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, one of the biggest obstacles or disincentives for people to do this is they're worried about, you know, uh, financially making this making this work. You know, a lot of the folks have kind of been sort of put in a system where they require heavy inputs. They've taken out huge loans. You know, it's kind of like, what is the turnaround time before they can sort of, how do they break free from that cycle, so to speak? What we are finding now, what it took uh, myself, Gabe Brown, Dave Brandt, and Greg Judy, and many others in, in this uh, sector of regenerative agriculture to accomplish, because we were, we were doing it when we knew very little about it, right? And we had to do a lot of things by the seat of our pants, by trial and error, and so forth. What it took us 20 plus years to do we can now accomplish and are accomplishing with many different farmers and ranchers in under three years. And let me give you one, one perfect example of that. Uh, it's a farmer by the name of Adam Grady, and Adam is located in, in Eastern North Carolina in, in the, uh, uh, the coastal plains. He, he's actually a producer for Joyce Farms. And, and Adam started, in the fall of 2016 was when he first started regenerative agriculture and they, they farmed 1,200 acres. He and his father were very skeptical at first because they had been very conventional farmers and they did not believe that these practices would work for them. So in their first year, they only allocated a small amount of acres to start this, but it worked so very well that in 2017, they put all of their acres into regenerative agriculture. And in 2018, so in just their second year of regenerative agriculture on 1,200 acres, they cut their input costs by $200,000, okay? So a staggering reduction in input cost on 1,200 acres in just the second year. At the end of year three, and I still remember it, uh, Adam called me up and he was very excited. It, it was shortly after Thanksgiving and he said, Alan, I just came back from my banker and I have to share this with you. I just paid off all my loans. I'm debt free at my bank and I just bought another farm paying all cash. That was at the end of 2019. And here in 2020, Adam has now secured yet another farm without debt. So that's how rapidly that you can do this. And yes, you're right. Most farmers think that, oh my gosh, in the first few years, this is going to cost me a lot of money. I'm going to lose a lot of income. 
And actually, it's quite the opposite. We see many who see positive returns in the very first year and then compounding returns each year after that. What is the, uh, so let's just kind of, you know, talk about the the day-to-day practice of this. I mean, obviously, temporary fencing, moving moving the cattle. Does it, do, do, does it have to be every single day? I, I see some people moving twice a day. Is it every day in every single environment, or does it depend really on the geography and the landscape and that type of and the breed of cattle and so on and so forth? Or how does that work typically? So I'll answer that in two ways. The first is that do they have to be moved every single day? No. Okay. Um, and that means that, for instance, even if you are moving every day during the week, if you want to take the weekend off or you have a wedding to go to or whatever, you can build paddocks large enough that they, it can easily accommodate them for the entire weekend, right? So it's all strategic and, and management driven. So you don't have to move every day. But what we do know is this, that the more frequently we do move them, the faster and better the results are going to be. And why? Again, because we're more closely simulating what the bison and antelope and all of those did in their very frequent movement. We, even in the desert, we are tending to move every day. Uh, Alejandro talked about that. He is moving every day, even in the desert, on a large landscape. Now, to do that, you don't always have to use temporary. We use a lot of poly wire fencing on reels, so it's temporary. We put it up and take it down every day, but it's very quick and simple to do. But in a more rugged environment like the desert or in mountainous environments, that can get hard to do. So a lot of times what Alejandro and other ranchers do in those types of environments is use herding. You know, cowboys and cowgirls like to be on horseback all day long. And so we just give them that opportunity to do that. We use them to, you know, their job is to herd the cattle and to keep them moving uh, each day. And that works quite well. The cattle learn very quickly how to herd, and how to easily be moved from one spot to the next to the next on a consistent basis. Yeah, one of the uh, advantages I had, I had read about or heard was, you know, something about, you know, well, off with multi-species, but just moving far enough, you know, maybe not to the exact adjacent paddock, but moving them down the way a little bit. This has to do with parasites because the manure is going to attract flies, it's going to produce parasites, and there's something with the, the dung beetles that come in. And can you talk a little bit about how to mitigate parasite issues by, by moving the cattle? Absolutely. Um, and, and for those that are interested, uh, a couple of months ago, I wrote an article called six ways to uh, control parasites in livestock. And that's posted on our, on our understandingag.com website. But basically, we can pretty much eradicate these fly and internal parasite cycles in our livestock by the way that we manage them without having to use the chemical dewormers and in and, and the, the organophosphate or pyrethroid fly control and all of that. And the key ways to do that are number one, frequency of movement. So the more frequently you move them, you're always moving them away from the parasites, the flies, the worms, all of that. So you're keeping them moving away from those new hatches. The second thing is that if we are not using those chemicals, those chemicals not only kill the target organisms like the internal brown stomach worms and things like that that we're targeting or the flies, face flies and horn flies and so forth, but they kill all the beneficials as well. So with, with killing the internal and external parasites using these chemicals, we're also killing things like dung beetles and earthworms and other beneficial beetles. And so we start to see those things return. We see earthworm populations returning and they'll take manure pats and incorporate it into the soil. Dung beetles do the same thing. We can see literally dozens of dung beetles on a single manure pat. And within a matter of a day or two, they have completely 
incorporated that manure pat back into the soil to become new carbon, new organic matter, and never giving those fly eggs and larvae a chance to survive. So that eradicates the internal and external parasites. Another way that we do it is through multi-species. And this simulates the way it used to be here in North America and on the Serengeti. We call it the Serengeti model. Running other species behind our cattle and our sheep. So uh, first of all, cattle and sheep and goats are in host to their individual parasites. So they can't be infected by the other's parasites. Secondly, if we run, say like pastured pigs and chickens and things like that, behind those, the pigs and chickens will basically root through those manure pats and they'll eat the fly larvae and the worm larvae and that type of thing. So when we combine all of those management practices together, then we're mitigating internal and external parasite problems. Yeah, that's, it doesn't sound particularly appetizing, maybe good for the pigs and the chickens, but uh, what, uh, you know, I, so are they like cattle on day one and then you move them off and the goats come in or, or the chickens come in or is they in there in the same time, the same, or are they sort of not stepping on each other and all that it, stuff? Yeah, typically it, it's a planned rotation. Now, a lot of times you can run uh, cattle and sheep and goats all together and they work very well together. Uh, and then the chickens are run behind them. So the chickens are not run at the, on the same day at the same time. Uh, they're run two to three days later. So we want the, the eggs from the flies that were laid to hatch out and to have viable larvae because the chickens eat that. That's a great protein source for them, right? Uh, and the worm larvae, great protein source for them, and, and they're dead-end host, so they don't impact the chickens at all. It's just a food source for the chickens. And, uh, and then we run the pigs behind the chickens. Uh, so it makes for a very elegant rotation that not only eradic eradicates those internal and external parasites, but it also has different types of impacts on the soil microorganisms, on the plant species growing there, on the beneficial insects, and on soil fertility. So we're getting these very positive compounding and cascading effects occurring, just like you do on the Serengeti, where you have multiple species of animals and birds following each other across the plains. Yeah, I had the opportunity to go to the Serengeti. Serengeti, it's a pretty spectacular place, I have to say, that, you know, that area there, and then in Gora Gora Crater, not far from there, but... Um, let me ask you about the, the so what is the, uh, I know you mentioned, let's get to 50% and uh, well, maybe one day 100%, but 50%, we get to that. What is the projections looking like for regenerative ag? How many, how, how many new ranchers are taking this up? Is this growing pretty well or what's the, what's the sort of a prevalence of the number of guys that are doing it? I know there's 700 some, some thousand cattle ranches in the U.S. What percentage are we getting to at this point? Yeah, so we're, you know, we're still well under 10%, uh, but, you know, just 20 years ago, we started off with, you know, less than a half a percent. Uh, so it's growing rapidly. It's growing exponentially, and, and it's growing faster and faster every year, and that's why our, you know, for instance, like our staff at Understanding Ag and our consulting has expanded very rapidly because of that. We're, we continue to have to add new people to help us with this. Uh, it, it's, the demand is almost becoming overwhelming uh, for, for people wanting to learn how to do this. And, and we, we're seeing tremendous traffic at our academies. Our academies are selling out. Uh, our webinars have large numbers of people attending each webinar in the hundreds and even a thousand or, or more each webinar. Uh, and we are, we're, we're seeing more and more farmers and ranchers who, frankly, just two years ago, five years ago, would have been completely skeptical and said, I want nothing to do with that. I don't even want to listen to you or hear about it, that are now seeking us out and saying, well, I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I, I, I do want to hear about it. Let, let's talk about it now. Uh, and COVID 
has only heightened that uh, because both farmers and ranchers are now seeing, wow, we've got to do something to create and build strong immune systems in our cells, in our livestock, in our soils. Uh, and consumers are seeing the same thing. Consumers are putting that pressure on the farmers and ranchers and they're starting to respond. So, in, and we're seeing response from people like companies like General Mills. You know, so we're doing a lot of work now with General Mills. They, they have us working with their farmers, their producers to be able to transition to regenerative on those farms. And, and GM is, is seeing that, hey, this is gonna be very, very beneficial to, to the consumers that buy our products. Yeah, and I, I think certainly as as a meat eater, I appreciate appreciate what you guys are doing. What is uh, what does it look like internationally? Are there other countries where this is more readily? I think sometimes USDA is maybe an impediment to what you guys are doing. Quite honestly, uh, are other country? Are you guys having international influence? And if so, what other countries are are starting to see this start to take off? Yes, uh, we have had many, many requests for doing academies and consulting in, in a lot of other countries, uh, 54 countries so far. Uh, and, you know, we're already doing academies in Canada and Mexico. Uh, we've got academies scheduled for Germany and a number of other places. We've had requests from the UK, from Australia, from New Zealand, from multiple countries in uh, Africa and South America. Uh, so, yes, other countries are catching on fast and are making rapid adoption. And so we, we are working very heavily globally right now. We're working very heavily to do this. Yeah, I just I, I see a lot of, uh, you know, obviously with COVID, we had a lot of sort of sort of interesting shifts, you know, when, when they kind of sort of ran out of meat. So they had to close the packing houses and people are bunch of attorney generals are looking into collusion between the big packing industries and there's a, there's a little bit of pressure on the industry to maybe make some adaptations <clears throat> what are your thoughts on a political solution versus just ranchers and consumers coming together is there any is there any hope for our political system to to significantly uh, steer people toward those carbon credits I, I don't know I'm just thinking thinking you know what might align with a politician and what you guys do yeah so I'm just going to be very upfront with you in that regard. And uh, we have had multiple, multiple conversations over the last, last two years with, uh, with a number of different politicians. Uh, some of those conversations good, some not so good. Uh, you know, there, I can say that there is increasing interest among political parties and, and individual politicians on regenerative ag but they're like everybody else. They need an education as well. Many of them do not understand what regenerative ag really is and what it means and what it can do for, for the environment, for ecosystems, and for the climate, and for consumer health. Uh, so we've been sort of frustrated in that regard uh, because it, it's very, very clear that on the political front, everybody has their own agenda, right? And it's their agenda. It's what they want to do. And oftentimes it's not what's best for everybody as a whole. So we run up against that in the political world quite frequently. And, and by the way, that's, that's both major parties, okay? They both have issues in that regard. And we've talked to both uh, and many different politicians from both. And, and I, I can honestly say that, you know, from our standpoint and what we're seeing I don't see where one's stepping up to the plate any more than the other at this point. I would hope that they will and both will, but it's not really happening yet because they're still too concerned about their own agendas rather than this broader, more important agenda. Uh, we're making much more rapid progress, quite frankly, on the grassroots level. Uh, and I think, you know, Ultimately, it's the consumers that hold the power over everybody, over politicians, over big companies, over farmers and ranchers. 
we make up less than 1% of the population now as farmers and ranchers. So we have no power whatsoever, no political swing at all. Uh, so the political power really comes from the consumer. And if the consumer determines and decides that they want healthy foods, they want nutrient dense foods, and they want a healthier climate and healthier ecosystems, they have the power through their food purchase choice decisions to be able to say that I want you, Mr. and Mrs. Farmer and Rancher, to do the right thing and to raise food this way. And I want you, my representatives and senators there in Washington, to make the right policy decisions to in further incentivize and encourage farmers and ranchers to make this transition and to help pay for their education because they do have to be educated. Again, you cannot know, you cannot do what you do not know. So all of these farmers and ranchers first have to obtain an education in regenerative agriculture before they can adequately and properly apply these practices and principles on their farms and ranches. Yeah, I think, you know, when I look at the I don't know, the landscape out there right now, I think the message that you, know, that you say that, hey, if we can get 50% of our ranches regenerating, we can mitigate the entire greenhouse gas issue. And if we get that out there and just hammer that message, I think that's going to resonate. You know, there's some people that aren't really excited about anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gases causing climate. I, I get that. But, I mean, I think that that's driving a lot of these people. You know, it's, we're seeing that. Um, let me ask you about your thoughts on we see a lot of you know money being invested heavily in alternative meats, uh, whether it's uh, the Beyond Meats, the Impossible Burgers, and the you know, whatever product that Tyson and Cargo are going to put out there, and and then and then after that the uh, the cell culture meat. Why is regenerative agriculture a better option than those things which are being heavily heavily pushed right now? Okay, so you opened a huge can of worms. I'm sure you're quite aware of that. And uh, we could talk literally hours on end about that. I'll give you a very quick synopsis here. Uh, first of all, the vast majority of the, of the food products that are sourced for those plant-based proteins are not regeneratively produced. They're very conventionally produced reliant on GMOs, reliant on high, high synthetic use, high levels of tillage, high levels of chemical use and all of that. Is that really the way that we want to go? Is that what we're saying that plant-based is okay uh, just because it's plant-based while we're seeing soils rapidly eroded and degraded and we're seeing tons of synthetics and chemicals being dumped into our waterways? Really? Really? I don't think so. Okay. Secondly, they're a highly, highly processed food product. And time will tell, absolutely will tell and will va validate that these highly processed products are not healthy for us at all. Just because it has soy protein isolate and soy protein concentrate and pea protein isolate in it does not make it a healthy product when you combine it with everything else that's in it. So, if you want to be a vegan, and that's everybody, obviously everybody's personal individual choice, but if, but if somebody wants to be a vegetarian or vegan, then eat whole foods, do it healthfully. You know, you can still get everything you need. You can get whole beans and whole peas and so on and so forth, whole grains. Consume those, don't consume them in a highly processed food product that is going to turn out to be deadly for you. Uh, you know, all that is is convenience. The number one, what is the number one ingredient in all of those products? By volume, water, water. So the consumer is paying a lot for water in these products. And I did a lot of price comparison on these products. The vast majority of these plant-based protein products, their burger patties and so forth, are, are more expensive than the highest price grass-fed hamburger. The average price in a grocery store when you put it on a per pound basis is 12 to $16 per pound. They can buy 
our grass-fed hamburger or anybody else's grass-fed hamburger out there for far cheaper than that on a price per pound basis and be getting a whole food product that is far more nutrient dense and healthy for you. It's that simple. Yeah, and I, I've looked into this, and you know, even even the cultured meat, you know, you've got all the the inputs. Those cells don't grow out of nothing. You gotta you gotta feed a monocrop uh, protein, you know, to do that. So it's the same old thing. Yep. Hey, Alan, uh, this has been great. I've got to run for another meeting, but this has been wonderful. Maybe we will get you back on here down the road. Can you tell folks where to find you? Find more information because I think some people, particularly people that are considering maybe some ranchers or other people, want to look into this because this is such important information to get out there. Where do they find your stuff at? Yep, absolutely. I've, I've seen a lot of questions come through, and I'd be happy to address those if anybody wants to email me. Uh, but they can find me either through JoyceFarms.com uh, or through UnderstandingAg.com or the SoilHealthAcademy.org. So if you email any one of those three, you will be able to get in touch with me. And just to, for clarification, Joyce is spelled J-O-Y-C-E. That's correct. J-O-Y-C-E and, and Joyce-Farms.com. Uh, and then again, understandingag.com and soilhealthacademy.org. Alan, thanks so much. This has been wonderful. Thanks for what you're doing. You know, we're all we're all here looking forward to helping any way we can as consumers, and we really like like this message and uh as meters, we care about where our food comes from, and you know, I think that's important. So, anyway, thank you so much. Thank Have you. Have a good one now. All right, Thanks. take care, guys. See everybody tomorrow.